Think of the last Muslim person you saw on TV. Who were they? What were they doing? Did you see a Muslim doctor inventing a new surgical technique that saves lives and money? Or did you see an engineer conducting soil tests to make sure that American communities are safe? No, more than likely what you saw was a nameless, shadowy character up to no good. And I can say this with confidence because media studies show that media images of Muslims are overwhelmingly negative. In fact, Media Tenor, a communications firm which analyzed over 2.7 million Western news stories, found that 9 out of 10 stories about Muslim life were related to violence. So what does this mean for how we see Muslim Americans? One answer is that these portrayals perpetuate and feed off of what scholars of religion refer to as religious illiteracy, or a lack of knowledge about world religions and their basic tenets. And this is problematic because these scholars argue that discrimination and stigmatization are fueled by religious illiteracy. We know that in America today, there is much religious illiteracy surrounding Islam in particular. In fact, Pew conducted a study and found that 55% of Americans say that they either know very little or nothing at all about Islam, and less than half of Americans say that they know a Muslim personally. So if you don't know much about Islam and you don't know Muslims personally, this leads an open gap for media representations to fill that picture in for you. In this video, we're going to begin rewriting these narratives to provide a more accurate and dynamic portrayal of Muslim American life. In media today, representations of Muslims portray them as a monolithic group when we know that this is not the case. In fact, ISPU conducted a national poll earlier this year and found that Muslims comprise America's most ethnically diverse faith group. In fact, there's no majority racial or ethnic group within the religion. This table shows a breakdown of ethnicity and race among the country's major religions. And what we find is that about approximately a quarter of Muslims identify as black or African American. 24% identify as white. 18% identify as Asian, primarily from places like South Asia, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and another 18% identify as Arab. Right away, we're seeing a big difference between what you see portrayed in the media and the empirical reality on the ground. This poll also tells us that Muslims are the most likely group to report low income. But as you can see, there's a wide spectrum of diversity in terms of socioeconomic status among Muslim Americans. So often we see Muslims portrayed at either end of the spectrum, either as the rich oil sheikh or perhaps a poor and destitute Muslim refugee. But the picture is more complex than that. Muslims also comprise America's youngest faith group. We can see here that Muslims had the largest share of Americans under the age of 30. This is largely due to fertility patterns as well as immigration patterns. What this tells us is that Islam is one of America's fastest growing religions, which means it's of the utmost importance that we learn more about this faith group. In terms of population size, Pew estimates that there are approximately 3.3 million Muslims in the country, comprising about 1% of the U.S. population. Here in Michigan, we estimate that there are approximately 274,000 Muslims, comprising less than 3% of Michigan's overall population, 2.75 to be exact. And they worship across the state. There are at least 90 mosques in southeastern Michigan, the western side of the state, and even in the Upper Peninsula. While the numbers are helpful, they don't tell us everything. So that's where the MAP project steps in to offer an intervention. We want to fill those widespread gaps in knowledge, and we do so by quantifying contributions of Muslim Americans in Michigan across eight key areas, including medicine, STEM, that's science, technology, engineering, and math, civics and democracy, philanthropy and nonprofit, education, economics, arts and entertainment, and sports. We want to combine hard facts with the human face, provide the empirical numbers that we need while also giving you the chance to get to know Muslims personally. In terms of methodology, we employed a mixed method study where we combined both quantitative and qualitative analyses. As a sociologist, when I want to conduct a impact study on a minority group in this country, one of the first sources of data I would normally turn to is the Census Bureau. However, because the census is barred by law from asking about religious identity or affiliation, we weren't able to use that method. That meant that we needed to get innovative with our research approach. In terms of the quantitative side of things, we employed a surname approach, wherein we took a listing of over 43,000 common Muslim names and cross-referenced it with listings that we obtained from the state of Michigan in professional fields. 
For example, using the Freedom of Information Act, we were able to obtain a listing of all of the licensed medical professionals in the state of Michigan. And with that, we were able to derive an estimate of Muslim participation across medical fields. We also conducted secondary data analyses of economic impact data as well as demographic data. In terms of the qualitative side of things, we conducted over 150 in-depth interviews with Muslims across the state combined with participant observation. And we applied this approach across all eight fields. I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Yahya Basha. Dr. Basha moved to Michigan in the 1970s to work on his medical degree, where he specialized in radiology. And after he graduated, he was unable to find work. He was facing workforce discrimination. He wasn't sure what to do, so he turned to some of his Jewish colleagues for advice who had experienced something of the same. And they said, you need to open up your own practice. People thought he was crazy to do so, because at the time, there weren't independent radiology clinics. But he went ahead with it and came up with a really innovative idea. Instead of having customers come to his clinic, he would load up the radiology equipment into a fleet of vehicles and take it to individual practices, inverting the whole model. This was really innovative because this meant that doctors could get the results that they needed for their patients right away, instead of waiting days or even weeks when they would send their patients to major hospitals. Almost right away, copycat businesses sprang up, and soon the hospitals were asking Dr. Basha for advice. Today, he's still known for cutting-edge techniques, including the open MRI machine, and keeping his clinics open on the weeknights and weekends to better serve Michigan patients. I tell this story not only because it is reminiscent of the ingenuity that marks Dr. Basha's career, but because it matches patterns that we heard throughout our interviews with medical professionals across the state, seeking better, more excellent care to better care for the needs of Michigan's residents. In terms of the numbers, we turned to that Muslim surname approach, and from that we learned that even though Muslims only comprise 2.75% of the state's population, they make up over 15% of the state's medical doctors, over 10% of the state's pharmacists, and more than 7% of the state's dentists. Using these figures, we were then able to estimate that Muslim medical doctors provide more than 1.6 million appointments to patients in Michigan per year that almost 40,000 jobs are indirectly supported by Michigan physicians, and that Muslim pharmacists fill over 15 million retail drug prescriptions per year. We also know that Muslims have contributed to many medical firsts and breakthroughs in their respective fields here in Michigan. For example, Dr. Mahmoud Hai, a urologist who practices in Westland, Michigan, invented a green light laser technology. What this does is it makes the treatment of prostate blockages less invasive and painful. His clinic was actually the first to participate in the FDA trials, making his clinic the first to utilize this technology. We also learned that medical professionals in the Muslim community are incredibly charitable not only participating in medical clinics in places like Haiti and Africa and all around the world, but also right here in Michigan, putting on free health clinics in Detroit, Saginaw, and Flint. Overall, we learned that Muslims contribute substantially to the state's overall well-being and health, and this is really important, especially as Michigan's population continues to age. The burden on our state's health care will be even greater, and Muslims are stepping up to fill that need. Now I'd like to introduce you to Lisa Gandhi. Lisa is a professor of computer science at Central Michigan University, where she specializes in natural language processing. Lisa is remarkable not only because she's the only woman in her entire department, but also because she spurred innovative new camps and projects for young girls to get them interested in STEM. She's also the chair of the university's Women in Technology Club. These initiatives are so important because less than a quarter of all STEM professions are held by women, and we learn that people like Lisa are stepping up to increase gender parity across STEM fields. In terms of the numbers, we were able to estimate that over 1,600 new patents were awarded to Muslim-led inventing teams in the state over the last five years, comprising over 4% of all of the patents awarded in that time period. There were 862 Muslim licensed professional engineers, comprising over 4% of the licensed engineers in the state. 
I'll note that in Michigan you don't need a license to become a professional engineer, so this number is actually probably quite higher. We learned that there were many people who are interested in inspiring the next generation of Michiganders to pursue a STEM career. This is really important because over the next 10 years, Michigan is expected to add over 10,000 new jobs across the STEM professions. We spoke to Syed Tayyam in Lansing, who leads an initiative to help STEM Michigan's brain drain and keep our talented professionals here in the state by connecting recent grads from Michigan State University to local engineering firms in the state. We also spoke with many, many Muslim women in the STEM field who had jobs from cyber engineering to structural engineering to even electrical engineering. They're really leading the way in their respective fields to increase gender parity. And we learned that this matched closely to something else that ISP learned in their national poll. And that's that Muslim women surpass their male counterparts in terms of educational attainment. And this is true especially in STEM. Now I'd like to introduce you to Leon El Elamin. Leon is the founder of the Maid Institute in Flint which is a nonprofit organization that helps to reintegrate and provide job services to the formerly incarcerated. Leon has a passion for this work because he himself was formerly incarcerated. This work is so important, and one of their biggest initiatives was their successful campaign to ban the box in Genesee County in 2014. Ban the box initiatives refer to the ability to remove the checkbox requ required on job applications that ask about former felony convictions. Research shows that these initiatives are so important because they're associated with a drastic reduction in unemployment among the formerly incarcerated. Leon's work really reflects this idea that we can learn from our past while looking forward to the future. And on this he reflected, so be inspired. Surround yourself with positive people and always educate yourself beyond what's being taught in classrooms. The world and life around you is just one big classroom and you can learn so much from it. Our research shows that Muslims are incredibly charitable. In 2015 alone, we learned that Muslim households donated at least $177 million to charity, over 1.3 million pounds of food, and over 45,000 articles of clothing, in addition to thousands of hours of mental health counseling, as well as medical care for almost 5,000 patients across Michigan, and the rehabilitation of hundreds of homes. To help put this in context, what this means is that the average Michigan household spent 18% more on charitable causes than did the average household nationally. Beyond individual giving, we also had the opportunity to sit down with the founders and organizers of many nonprofit organizations across the state, where we learned that they're meeting basic human needs like food, shelter, and water, as well as going above and beyond to meet services that maybe you didn't even think about. One example of an organization that does both with excellence is Zaman International, founded by Naja Bazi. Zaman is located in Inkster, Michigan, and over the last five years, they've received over 60,000 donations of food, clothing, and furniture. But they also go above and beyond. They offer a very special Plots for Tots program, which provides an infant burial service for any family in southeastern Michigan who can't afford this very important service. This is really important because this is something that most of us dare not think about, yet Zaman is there for families who need it. We also learned that in the wake of the Flint water crisis, Muslims were stepping up to fill needs for Flint residents. Our researchers happened to be in Flint right as the news story was breaking national press about what was going on with the Flint water crisis. While there, we determined that Muslims were among the first to begin breaking ground to replace the leaded pipes we learned that Muslims donated over one million bottles of water to Flint residents. We also learned that medical doctors from across the state were driving into Flint to provide free medical care on nights and weekends, putting on free dermatological clinics to help residents who were facing skin problems due to the leaded water. Now I'd like you to meet Dr. Abdul Al Syed. Abdul was the former health commissioner for the city of Detroit a position that he revived under Mayor Michael Duggan. Before he came to this position, the city health services were actually placed outside the city and operated as a nonprofit. He brought the services back within the city purview and increased the operating budget from just $1 million a year to over $10 million. 
He also started innovative programs where he nucleated health city services. That is, instead of expecting city residents to travel from afar to get the services that they need, he would bring them to them. For example, in the wake of the Flint water crisis, he proactively sought over $100,000 in grant money to begin testing for lead levels in all Detroit public schools. So the burden wasn't placed on individual parents to conduct these tests themselves. He also began walking programs in order to spur more physical activity and healthier lives across the city of Detroit. Our team uncovered that there are over 35 Muslims across the state of Michigan who currently hold public office. They serve at both state and local levels. Some represent the entire state of Michigan, that's almost 10 million residents, and others participate across 11 different municipalities. We learned that there are over 700 Muslim lawyers registered with the state bar, comprising about 2% of all lawyers in the state. We also learned that Michigan is home to many trailblazers in America's Muslim community. For example, Judge Adam Shakur is America's first Muslim judge. Rashida Tlaib is the first Muslim woman to serve in the Michigan State House of Representatives. Al Haydus became the first Muslim mayor in the United States, where he served in Wayne, Michigan. Fadwa Hamoud was the youngest prosecutor in the state. And Hamtramck, Michigan, that's home to the nation's first Muslim majority city council. Muslims across the state are also committed to transforming Michigan's civic landscape, from get out the vote campaigns to helping reduce tax foreclosures. For example, Eric Sabri, who's the treasurer of Wayne County, oversees one of the highest concentrations of tax foreclosures in the entire country. So he started a new measure to reduce these by taking preventative steps to intervene before home foreclosures take place. And because of this, home foreclosures have went down 36% in the county. From this, we know that Muslims contribute substantially to the state's overall well-being in terms of civics and democracy, protecting and championing the rights not only of their own communities, but everybody in the state. Now I'd like to introduce you to Salim Khaled. Salim has a long and storied career in Detroit's banking sector. He served as Standard Federal Savings and Loan, that's now known as Bank of America's, first African-American and Muslim vice president. Over his career, he was able to address many structural inequalities. For example, he understood that many in Detroit were facing discriminatory lending practices that stopped them from being able to obtain the mortgages that they need. So he started a coalition of local organizers, banks, and businesses in order to raise over $4 billion in funds that help provide lending, mortgages, as well as job training services to people throughout southeastern Michigan. In terms of economic impact, we learned that Michigan Muslims make a substantial contribution to the state's overall economy. For example, we pulled consumer spending data and learned that Michigan Muslim households spent over $5.5 billion in the state's economy. That's certainly money our state would miss. In terms of the top line findings, we learned that compared to the average household in America, Michigan's Muslims spent 20% more in total consumer spending, four times more in education, and two times more on apparel and related services. In terms of entrepreneurship and job creation, we learned that in 2015, Muslims owned and operated over 35,000 businesses in the state, comprising over 4% of the state's small businesses. We also learned that Muslim-owned businesses employed over 100,000 Michiganders. Now I'd like to introduce you to Zainab Salman, a social studies teacher at a public high school in Canton, Michigan, where she estimates that she's taught over 1,000 students over her career. She comes from a long line of teachers and educators, and she has a passion for getting her students to connect with social history. And on this she reflects, teaching history is not just about understanding names and dates or people, it's also about realizing it has a point of connectivity, that this actually has an influence on my life. And this type of passion and dedication was found among all of the teachers and educators that we spoke to. We learned that in Michigan alone, that there are over 1,100 licensed K-12 teachers in the state, and that this number is growing rapidly. In fact, it's grown over 127% over the last five years. 
we learned that Muslim K-12 teachers educate nearly 30,000 pupils across the state and that the average Muslim household spent four times more on education and related services than did the average household nationally. We spoke to so many teachers, educators, vice principals and principals across the state of Michigan who are dedicated to making public schools better across the state. We also spoke with leaders in the charter school industry who are dedicated to serving a exceptionally diverse student body across the state of Michigan. In sum, we learned that Muslims are dedicated to education and not just for their own communities but for the entire state of Michigan. They recognize that our state's future depends on it. This is Zarina Elamine. Zarina is the founder of Nia Press in Detroit, a book publishing company that grew out of her own desire to publish her own writings. Nia Press has published over 10 books. She also publishes an annual series of calendars called Beautifully Wrapped, which features men and women from around the world who cover their hair for religious and cultural reasons. The proceeds from this go to fund education programs across the world for young girls. She wants to use her platform in order to encourage others to write and publish. And on this she reflects, there's so much wisdom and knowledge in the world and I want to help people take the initiative to share it. This quote reflects a lot of what we heard among the Michigan's artists and entertainers. We spoke to not only writers, but painters, filmmakers, poets, and more who recognize the power of art to connect people across social boundaries of race, class, gender, and religion in order to bring the world closer together and bridge cultural gaps. This is Rahaf Khatib, an international marathoner who's completed over seven international marathons, 14 half marathons, and countless other races. Her first marathon was the Detroit Free Press Run, and most recently she's run in the Boston Marathon. Ahead of her run in the Boston Marathon, she used her immense online following of thousands of Instagram followers to raise money for charitable causes here in Michigan. Most recently, she was featured in Runner's World magazine, and also on the cover of Women's Running Magazine. Sports has an amazing power to connect people from all walks of life, and the athletes and sports lovers that we spoke to recognized this power and harnessed it for good. There were countless individuals that we spoke to whose contributions couldn't be categorized simply in one of the eight categories, so we refer to them as Renaissance contributors. One such example is Jumandola Alamari who is a cybersecurity engineer at Wayne State University. She's also the founder of the Arab American Women's Business Council, where she promotes entrepreneurship among women in southeastern Michigan. But what's unique about her is that she's also been appointed to the Michigan Underground Storage Tank Authority Board by Governor Rick Snyder. This is a really important job that she fills because across the state of Michigan, there are storage tank facilities on industrial sites that hold contaminated wastes. And it's really important that these storage tanks stay up to spec or else they might leak hazardous materials into our soil and waterways. Juman's been appointed to this board to make site visits to make sure that these storage tanks are doing what they need to do. And if not, she's in charge of over $40 million in remediation funds to help clean up. This was a job that we never even thought about before we began this project, but as we started doing this research, we learned that there are Muslims filling roles we never even thought of, and they smash stereotypes along the way. So what do all of these findings tell us? Together, we learned that Muslims contribute substantially to Michigan's overall well-being and health, and that these findings contrast starkly with the typical depictions of Muslims in mainstream media. In doing so, these, this project offers a critical intervention in this feedback loop I've presented on the right side of the slide, where you start at the individual level, the individual citizen, who, as I said, may not know much about Islam or Muslims. But the problem doesn't just stay there among individuals. These are voting constituents who have the ability to vote in politicians who can make policy on their behalf. These policies are then presented in media, which gets fed back down to the individual citizen. The question becomes, how do we intervene? How do we slow or stop this cycle? And this is where the MAP project steps in. First, we offer 
knowledge and education to the individual citizen. But in the report, we also offer recommendations to policymakers, both here in Michigan and across the United States, who we believe need to better serve their Muslim constituents. We also offer recommendations for media makers, who are duty-bound to present fuller, more complex images of Muslim life. We also offer recommendations for advocates, allies, and Muslim organizations. And the full report can be downloaded at muslimsforamericanprogress.org. Now I'd like to draw a historical parallel that I think might elucidate what's at stake with the Muslim community today. The example I want to give is another religious minority group in this country, and that's Catholic Americans over 100 years ago. The Catholic population in this country was growing very quickly at the start of the 20th century due to immigration, mainly from places like Southern and Eastern Europe. And they faced widespread discrimination and hostility. It was feared that Catholics' religious doctrine was at odds with American ideals of democracy and freedom. It was feared that Catholics may be prone to violent extremism and that they might even stall a papal state if not kept in check. Catholics in this time period faced xenophobia at each of the three levels outlined in the feedback loop from the previous slide. At the individual level, there was rising hate crimes, and in fact, the KKK even visited the Shrine of the Little Flower Parish in Royal Oak, Michigan, where they burned crosses on the front lawn. In terms of media representation, violent images were publicly shared widely. For example, take a look at this political cartoon. This image depicts Catholics robbed of their humanity, portrayed as crocodiles swarming the shores of America, threatening who were perceived the most vulnerable in this country, that is, Protestant children. In the background, you see that government buildings are under siege and that other institutions are crumbling in the wake of the rise of the Catholic tide. You might think that this is a fringe publication or cartoonist, but actually this was published in Harper's Weekly Magazine, which is one of the highest circulated publications at the time. And Thomas Nast is one of the most prolific cartoonists of the period, who's known for popularizing modern images of Uncle Sam, as well as the donkey and elephant for the Democratic and Republican parties, respectively. What this tells us is that these types of violent imagery were rampant in this period. But it didn't stop there. At the policy level, 100 years ago this year, in 1917, the Immigration Act was passed restricting migration based on national origin for the first time, specifically targeting populations from Southern and Eastern Europe, primarily Catholics, although other religious minorities were also caught up in this as well. The policy was then expanded in 1924. I bring this up for two reasons. One is to highlight a bit about my own biography. I'm often asked when I give these talks, why do I, a non-Muslim, conduct research on Muslim Americans? Beyond championing the rights of Muslims and American pluralism, it's because my own ancestors were Catholics who arrived in this country just before these immigration restrictions were put in place. They came from places like Poland and Italy and Lebanon, and I feel really lucky that they got here before they were barred from coming. And today, few would question my American patriotism based on my family's religious identity, and I think a long view can help in thinking about Muslims today. And that brings me to my second point. It's that old adage that those who do not learn from history are destined to repeat it. A hundred years later, we see so much of the same. It was Catholics then, Muslims today, so who is next? And does there have to be a next? We can learn lessons today and stop the current wave of hostility by educating ourselves. I'd like to end with an idea from one of our founding fathers and author of the Declaration of Independence, Thomas Jefferson, who instructs us that an educated citizenry is a vital requisite for our survival as a free people. That is, education and democracy go hand in hand. So the onus is on us as American constituents to learn more, to challenge discrimination when we see it, and we do so by learning more and sharing more. So I encourage you all to log on to our website, view these beautiful portraits, and hear the stories of Muslim Americans in Michigan, and download the full report. For any information presented elsewhere in these slides, you can visit ispu.org.